Let's talk about cardiac vessel abnormalities. So if you have abnormalities in your vessels and you can't deliver the right blood to where it needs to go, your peripheries can be cyanotic or cyanosis as we call it. This can be broken down into central or peripheral. Central cyanosis, you have normal cardiac output, but your extremities, you'll see some areas that are blue, your conjunctiva will be lighter, it's slightly blue, and the issue isn't the amount of blood being pumped, it's just a lack of oxygen. This is common with babies young infants, newborns, peripheral cyanosis. This is low blood flow, poor blood flow from the heart, poor vasculature in your extremities. When you feel your extremity, it will be cold. This is peripheral cyanosis. Central, your peripheral extremity will be warm. So cyanotic babies, AKA blue baby, you must be able to recognize what, are, what causes this. And this is the T's, the Tetralogy of Fallot, transposition, truncus arteriosus and tricuspid atresia, which we'll dive into. Tetralogy of Fallot, there's four components you must know. Pulmonary stenosis, right ventricular hypertrophy, overriding aorta. This is basically due to a rightward deviation of the aortic valve and now overrides ventricular septum. So pulmonary stenosis, right ventricular hypertrophy, overriding aorta, ventricular septal defect. We said VSDs, if the hole is small, the sound is loud. We said the sound you'll hear later on, holosystolic left sternal border. The shunt that causes cyanosis is right to left. That makes sense because the right side of the heart has the lack of oxygen. It hasn't gone through the pulmonary artery to the lungs. What causes tetralogy of Fallot? And it is the anterior superior displacement of the infundibular septum, also known as the conus arteriosus. Again, anterior and superior displacement of the septum. What will you hear? Systolic ejection murmur. It could be crescendo, decrescendo, left sternal border. If you have a VSD, it could be holosystolic. There could be a single S2. This is because there's no sound now from this pulvonic valve. So there is a, duff, a couple of different things you can hear for a tetralogy of flow. That's because there's multiple issues happening. So make sure you recognize it can present itself as a VSD because it's one of the four components or it can classically have its crescendo, decrescendo murmur, again, heard at the left sternal border. Tetralogy of Fallot's cyanosis, this is due to the high resistance to the pulmonary artery. This is because we have an overriding aorta. So now there is a tough time for blood to go from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery. This is because we said there's pulmonary stenosis. So now blood will go from the right ventricle to the aorta and to the systemic circulation. This will cause cyanosis, all right? So that overriding aorta coupled with pulmonic stenosis, blood from the right ventricle will go to this body. And this is low O2 blood. This will lead to cyanosis. And if there's a severe enough cyanosis, that can be incompatible with life. So how do people survive? If you have a patent ductus arteriosus and it's open, this will help shunt blood from left to right. So now the aorta will give blood to the pulmonary artery to the lungs. This helps it get oxygen to then get pumped out. So if somebody has tetralogy of flow, you would want to keep the PDA patent, and we said you do that with prostaglandins. Make sure you're being able to put these facts together. There are certain maneuvers that a child can do to improve his cyanosis. They call them tet spells. If a baby starts crying, they can turn blue. What does the baby typically do? It'll squat. This will help improve cyanosis by increasing venous return. Blood going back to the heart, what will this do? It will help decrease the shunting and promote more blood to the lungs. We want more oxygen. Also, what you can do is put knees to the chest for the child. So again, tet spells is when a young person with tetralogy of Fallot cries, they turn blue. What you need to know is squatting will improve this because it will help increase venous return and it will also increase afterload. And this will promote blood going to the lungs. So here's a chest x-ray of somebody with tetralogy of Fallot. Well, you need to recognize if you're seeing this chest x-ray, you must think, wow, this is a strange shaped heart. And it is. So look at it, the apex is abnormally positioned and there's signs of right ventricular hypertrophy. This is a boot shaped heart. This is strange. You have to make sure you understand normal before we look at these abnormal ones. But this is a classic picture of a boot shaped heart. 
transposition of the great vessels, things are moved around. So you must know normal to understand and appreciate abnormal. So what is the cause of transposition of great vessels? So it's a failure of the aortico-pulmonary septum to spiral. This also is a problem due to the neural crest cells aren't migrating right, so it contributes to this failure of the aortico-pulmonary septum to spiral. Things are moved around in different spots if they're not supposed to spiral to where they should be. So in this case, your pulmonary artery is now from your left ventricle and aorta is from your right ventricle. Normally, your pulmonary artery comes from your right ventricle, all right? But now it's from your left ventricle. So what they like to test you on is what is anterior to what? So normally, your aorta is posterior to your pulmonary artery. In the case of transposition of great vessels, the aorta is now anterior to the pulmonary artery, and that's something you must understand. Make sure you know this. Who commonly gets transposition of great vessels? You must understand it's common when you're born to a diabetic mother, so maternal diabetes is a risk factor. You have to know, we said this is one of those T's, so the child will be cyanotic. And realistically, this is not compatible with life unless their PDA is open and there's a big shunt. So if we keep the PDA open, what do we do? Prostaglandins. Let's talk about truncus arteriosus. This is a single large vessel from both ventricles since the truncus fails to divide into a septum. This is caused from the failure of the neural crest cells again to migrate and form the septum. So again, truncus arteriosus is a single large vessel from both ventricles. So usually it divides into the aorta and pulmonary artery, but now it does not. So this is one of those T's. This can cause cyanosis. This is seen in DeGeorge's. So DeGeorge's syndrome, what you need to know is catch 22. Let's keep it simple. Cardiac abnormal, truncus arteriosus, abnormal facies. Thymic is absent, low T cells. Cleft palate for C, H for hypocalcemia. 22 for the 22nd chromosome. What you should be able to take away from this is that you have low T cells, you have immunocompromised state. If you have low calcium from the low parathyroid, this eventually can lead to tetany or seizures. So make sure you understand this. But the biggest thing was this cardiac abnormality tie-in that we just did, truncus arteriosus. Let's talk about tricuspid atresia. So this is abnormal AV valve formation within the endocardial cushing. What you need to know is there's agenesis of the tricuspid valve. Therefore, blood cannot go from the right atrium to the right ventricle. So it's not compatible with life unless you have an atrial septal shunt and a ventricular septal shunt and your PDA is open. You need all kinds of shunting to help correct this problem. So let's just give one example of keeping the PDA open. What would we give? So we give a prostaglandin analog. An example could be alprostadil, all right? Eventually they'll still need surgery. This is a very bad thing to inherit. Let's talk about Epstein's anomaly. Epstein's anomaly is interesting because it happens to kids who are born to moms who are taking lithium. Lithium is used for seizures. Lithium is an ion, it can go across, so it can cause problems. And you know, it can cause hypothyroidism, thyroid dysfunction, but it also can lead to Epstein anomaly. So Epstein anomaly is when your tricuspid valve leaflets are now displaced. So they call it into the right ventricle. So this is an atrialization of the right ventricle. So what can develop? You can get tricuspid regurge, you can get right heart failure, and your enlarged right atrium, and a small right ventricle, just because of the leafs now being into the right ventricle. So basically, you have atrialization of the right ventricle. The leafs are now displaced downwards and into the right ventricle. This is caused, again, by lithium exposure. And what's interesting is this is common with Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. And again, what will you see on the EKG with that syndrome? A delta wave. So remember, Lithium exposure can lead to Epstein's anomaly. This is right atrialization of the right ventricle. Eisenmenger syndrome, this is a component of shunting. So what happens here is you have a left to right shunt from a VSD, PDA, or ASD. Over time, it can cause right ventricular hypertrophy. It can also cause pulmonary stenosis. And all these things will increase the right heart's pressure until it comes higher than the left. And then the shunt will reverse. And when the shunt reverses, you get cyanotic, low oxygen blood going to the body. And what will that lead to? It will lead to cyanosis. And things of cyanosis can be clubbing, and also you can have compensation. So if your body has low oxygen everywhere, and your body's kidney will say, what's going on? And it will secrete EPO. And this will lead to reactive compensatory polycythemia, and your hematocrit will be elevated. 
All right, let's talk about temporal giant cell vasculitis. So it's temporal arteritis, also called giant cell vasculitis. It's giant cell vasculitis because there's giant cells. Look at this histology here. You see the giant cells. This is granulomatous inflammation. Granulomatous inflammation, you must understand, it comes from granuloma, right? CD4 cell, type 1 TH T cell, and macrophages. These are the big players in the granuloma. What will these people come with? They will present as somebody greater than 50 years old. They'll have a headache, typically to one side, jaw claudication, polymyalgia rheumatica, meaning joint pain or throughout, and they can have visual field effects. Interestingly, on labs, when you draw labs, you look at their CBC, BMP, you also should look at things that show signs of inflammation, like CRP, which is C-reactive protein, and ESR, okay? So these patients will have an elevated ESR, which is erythrocyte sedimentation rate. So the interesting thing with these patients is to diagnose them, you need to do bilateral temporal artery biopsies. And this is where you'll see those giant cells. All right, now, what do you do with the patient with this? You need to give them high dose steroids. You need to prevent blindness. This is very important. You must prevent blindness by giving high dose steroids. Let's next talk about Takayasu arteritis. All right, think of the A's, okay? So we got A for aortic arch. A for Asian, all right? And then we have A for absent pulse type of thing. So this will be a classically a female around 30 to 40 years old, Asian, one of our A's. And you'll have reduced or absent, another one of our A's, pulses in their upper extremities. So they call this the pulseless disease. They'll also have some constitutional signs, which would be fever or night sweat, all right? So commonly affects the aortic arch. So Takayatsu, triple A, right? Asian, aortic arch, absent pulse. This will also have granulomatous inflammation, which we showed before, CD4, TH1, macrophage are the players. They like to ask you these things, so I'm emphasizing them. Kawasaki disease is very important to know. This is also known as mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome. This affects young children around four or five years old or less. They tend to be Asian. It's idiopathic autoimmune in nature. It can affect the whole body from top down. So in the mouth, you can see red mucosal lesions. You can see a strawberry tongue as shown here. They can have a red rash somewhere in their trunk, abdomen, chest. In addition, they can have some conjunctival inflammation, cervical lymphadenopathy, and abdominal lymphadenopathy. So what you must know for this is that if you see a child that's around four or five and they have a fever, and the fever is at least five or six days, think Kawasaki. So again, let's say you read a vignette and it says there's a young child who has a fever and this fever is at least four or five days long, you must think, train yourself to understand Kawasaki until proven otherwise. Berger's disease. This is also known as thromboangiitis obliterans. Where is it common? It's common in the tibia and radial arteries. What will you see? Thrombosis. So what will that lead to? Tingling, numb, burning sensations, and you can have ulceration slash gangrene shown in the photo to the side. In particular, what's a hallmark is you'll see segmental thrombosis. So under the microscope, when you look, you'll see segmental thrombosis. Who is this common in? Always people who smoke, aka tobacco users. They tend to be less than 35, but they have a big history, at least 10 years, of tobacco use. Polyarteritis nodosa. Who is this common in? This is common in elderly males, and they also have a high risk of hep B. This is interesting because in this disease, it spares the pulmonary artery. But what you'll see when you look at the microscope is this isn't segmental like the last one we talked about. What you'll see is necrotizing vasculitis that is transmural. So polyarteritis nodosa, risk factors is hep B, sparse pulmonary artery, the vasculitis is transmural. Wagner's granulomatosis, also called granulomatous with polyangiitis. C-shaped configuration, we got the nasopharynx, the sinus, we have your lungs, we have your kidney. These are the problem areas. So these people have upper respiratory tract infections, sinusitis, hemoptysis, hematuria, and cough, right? So C-shaped, so they'll be positive for C-anca, and this will be for antiprotonase 3 as well. So again, Wegener granulomatosis will have C-anca positive for antiprotonase 3, C-shape, so you got your sinusitis, you have your lung problems, you have your kidney problems, you'll find necrotizing granulomas. Let's talk about Churg-Strauss. This is different than Wagner's. These patients have asthma. Yeah, they also have sinusitis, but what's special is asthma, purpura, and some peripheral neuropathy, such as a wrist drop. 
So we said a couple P's, purpura, peripheral neuropathy. So these are P anca. So asthma, P anca, peripheral neuropathies, purpura. This is Churich Strauss. So Churich Strauss also has eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. So in the periphery, when you look around, you'll see increased levels of IgE and eosinophils because it's called eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. So remember, Churich Strauss is P anca. Wegner's was C. Anka. Hunox Schloen purpura. This is an interesting case. Somebody has an upper respiratory tract infection, and then around a week later or less, they have this classic triad. Triad is arthralgias, abdominal pain, palpable purpura on the legs and butt. This is common because it's common with IJ nephropathy, which is common worldwide. So let's take a step back. Let's review. We'll call it HSP. It occurs when somebody recently had a URI. And now they have arthralgias, abdominal pain, palpable purpura on the legs and butt. And you can see an image to the side. This is what it will present like. You must know this to be able to diagnose it. Peripheral artery disease is very common and it's a very high yield topic to understand. It is caused by intermittent claudication. This is people who have pains, aches, fatigues when they walk. So if you have a patient that comes in, they say, how is life? What is your exercise routine like? This is how you help tease it out. They say, you know what, I get some leg and calf pain after I walk for about 10 to 15 minutes. You should think in yourself, okay, this could be PAD, peripheral artery disease. So what helps relieve this issue? And the answer is always rest, right? So this limb, this area is commonly cold, numb, and they can get pain at night and pain over long periods of time with walking. So ways to diagnosis, you can do an ankle brachial index. It'll be less than one. This will show stenosis of a peripheral artery of the leg. What can this be from? It could be from a narrowed artery and we talked earlier about atherosclerosis and this can lead to peripheral artery disease. So risk factors that we can modify is we can optimize blood pressure, we can get lipids lower, and we can change lifestyle such as diet. Raynaud's phenomenon. This is caused by excessive vasoconstriction of arteries and arterioles in the periphery. So look at your hand, right? So here's a picture of a hand and you can see two of the digits there are pale. So this is seen in scleroderma, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis or thrombiangitis obliterans, which remember we said was segmental vasculitis by smokers, all right? So this is seen in scleroderma. Interesting fact you should know is they have autoantibodies to SCL70. Lupus, they have autoantibodies to DNA. Rheumatoid arthritis is autoantibodies to joints. Thrombiangitis obliterans, this is different. This is from smoking. So these people have these autoantibody type of things. In this case, Raynaud's phenomenon, it's due to too much inflammation. So what will you see in labs? You'll see that C-reactive protein and your ESR, both of them will be elevated. So this can be caused by people who are taking drugs such as beta blockers. It could be a side effect. So how do you treat this if somebody comes in? Well, the drug of choice right now is nifedipine and it is a calcium channel blocker to treat Raynaud's phenomenon. Do not miss this. They'll show you their hand. One part of it will be pale.